Okay, Namaskar. Good afternoon to all. I am Subhas Das, Convener Organizing Committee. I am, uh, I am very happy to give the pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Organizing Committee of today's International Multidisciplinary Webinar on COVID-19 Pandemic Impact and Evidences for Higher Education, organized by the Department of Education in collaboration with IQAC of the Ballets. Thank you for taking our time out and being here today. Respected Principal Madam, Dr. Gina Mani Bhuya, respected High Principal Madam, Dr. Kutlov Sikon, Sri Gal Soles, Zurhat, Asam India. Our honorable speaker, sir, Professor K. Pusto Nadam, sir, Professor, Department of Education and Administration, University of Baroda, Gujarat, India. Dr. Sude Gupta Bora, Associate Professor leading the neurodevelopmental follow up and outcome group at Meta Research Institute, Faculty of Medicine, University of Queensland, South Brisbane, Australia, and Honorable Professor Nilo Thandoy, Head of the Department of Education, Tespre University, Assam, India. My respected participants, dear students, and my dear respected colleague friends. Now we are going to start our webinar. At the beginning of the webinar, I request our principal madam to deliver her welcome address. So, please, ma'am. Good afternoon to everybody. First of all, on behalf of the organizing committee, I welcome all the participants and viewers to this international webinar on COVID-19 pandemic impact and strategies for higher education. The COVID-19 pandemic has significantly disrupted our traditional education system due to worldwide lockdown, which have been imposed to resist the spread of the pandemic. UNESCO estimates that more than 1.5 billion students across the world find themselves outside the classroom. To avoid a complete breakdown of the learning process, educational institutions have adopted the online or any other virtual mode for academic delivery to ensure continuity in curriculum, even in higher education. But in a country like India, academic delivery for a virtual mode becomes a big challenge, where only 15% household has internet connection, insufficient digital infrastructure, poor internet connectivity, internet accessibility, speed, stable power supply, these are a big problem. India stands 89th position on internet speed and stability. Besides this, students and teachers both are not so technically expert for this new approach. Apart from this, the structural imbalances are still present between rural and urban, male and female, poor and rich in the digital world. But we have to adopt the new transformation of educational delivery where we'll change the whole future scenario of education. So new strategy is needed to ensure the accessibility of learning to the student by virtual mode to develop the online education system, drastic change in course curriculum are required. Teachers needs to be retrained or oriented. Education process needs to be changed by making it more practical with the use of technology. Content, delivery, and access. These three will act as a changing agent in shaping up online education. Higher education sector is the critical determinant of the country's economic future. The pandemic significantly not only affect the teaching learning system, but also it increased the unemployment rate from 8.45% to 23%. So immediate measures are required to the effect of the pandemic on job offer, internship program, and research work. In the time for the capacity building of the young generation, a well-rounded, effective, skill developing educational practice is needed which creates employability productivity health and well-being for overall progress of india 
I think the new education policy will bring some hope it disregards. So it is the need of the hour to discuss about the problems and prospects of the crisis. I think this webinar, the resourceful lectures will give all the participants and viewers some clues in this respect. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alveda, for your good welcome speech. Now we are going to start our first technical session in this session. I would like to invite Professor Karnam Ustanadam Sir, Professor, Department of Educational Administration, MS University, Bolga, Gujarat. Before going to start his speech, I would like to Mr. Jugesh Sangmai to give introduction of our speaker, sir. Now I hand over to Jugesh Sangmai. Thank you, Dr. Das. We are very pleased. We have Professor Pranam Puspanadam, sir. And now I am going to introduce him on behalf of the Education Department of the College. Professor Pranam Puspanadam has been teaching in the Maharaja Sarajiro University of Boroda for the last 25 years in the area of education and education management, conducted research and community or peace program, providing consultancy services in total quality management in education, research development, and educational leadership. He is a member of Senate of Maharaja Sarajiro University of Boroda since 2012. He is a member of Senate National Institute of Fashion Technology Ministry of Textile, Government of India. He is coordinator of UGC in the Department of Education and Administration. He is the Dean of Students and Dean of Sports Faculty of Education and Psychology. The Maharaja Sarajya University of Boroda. He is also a member of Academic Board School of Education, Tespo University, Assam. He is a member of resource team of various organizations like NARC, UGC, NCT, NCRT, NIPA, etc. He is also a member of Swedish Institute Guest Fellowship at the Institute of International Education, Stockholm University, Sweden. And he is Erasmus. Mundas Visiting Professor Fellowship at the Department of Education, Arhas University, Denmark. He is also active member of ESM of Lifelong Learning Hub, Arhas University, Copenhagen, Denmark. He is also an academic consultant to British Council on Global Teacher Accreditation Program, India, as well as he is also a member of Research Group of Education for Rural Transformation. Department of Education, Stockholm University, Sweden. He is also indo Danish academic program on education for global citizenship. Equally, he is also a visiting professor at the Assumption University, Thailand, as well as the visiting professor at the Urfa University, Thailand. He is also a directed international training program with Life Academy in Karsland, Sweden, sponsored by SIDA on ICT and pedagogic development. He is also directed at international training program for the district education officers of Afghanistan funded by Swedish Committee of Afghanistan Theater. Now I request Dr. Das to uh, introduce Professor Koronam Kusponatham again. Very good morning, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, it's my pleasure to share some of my ideas on higher education, especially in the times of uh, COVID-19, a pandemic. We have been uh, experiencing this uh, deadly virus, not only in the, in the country, but also throughout the world. The only precaution which we could take is we must uh, 
stay away from each other you call it as a social distancing but in the times of social distancing we have to close down all the institutions to great extent and in fact uh, not only education institutions we have closed down all the sectors whether it is industry whether it is business whether it is education whether it is uh, the social organizations we have closed down but as a ray of hope the courage and the conviction of the teachers and the potential of the uh, technology and the commitment and the compassion of the teachers across the globe have really connected each and every child each and every learner if not physically but uh, digitally friends uh, this is a collective effort of all the teachers across the world exhibiting demonstrating their basic passion towards teaching and learning so before i begin my presentation today let me congratulate all the teachers fraternity in the world for their continuous commitment and compassion towards teaching towards sharing of their knowledge and towards reaching the unreached in this uh, unprecedented and uh, uncertain times of covid friends another significant thing that happened am i audible to everyone please dr subhash hello hello yes sir am i audible to everyone yes yes sir the voice is clear yes sir okay good yeah yeah so before i begin my presentation today i would like to recall the approval of national education policy 2020 which we have been trying to understand our political commitment our educational priorities and the future vision of education in our country and we must express our sincere gratitude to all the the leaders of the country for timely releasing the education policy as a promise to this nation that we are actually moving ahead in the in learning in education and in quality of life and living friends uh, in the beginning the madam said the unesco report states there are about 1.37 billion students it's almost uh, a population of india 1.3 billion the population of india and such a large population of uh, students in about 138 countries across the world have been affected with this covid and if you see the number of teachers we have 60.2 million teachers who have not gone to the real classroom since march but they have been serving for knowledge by sitting at their homes experiencing with the technology and then 
meeting the educational needs knowledge needs of people across the country friends uh, we must uh, understand what is the vision of our educational policy today the national education policy 2020 says it envisions the india centered education system in a very important word which we need to note it down india centered education system which means we are actually evolving from the local wisdom what we have uh, in our country and then contributing towards the transformation of our nation into a sustainable and equitable and a vibrant knowledge society you know the statement the vision clearly says we are moving towards a locally india centered education to globally knowledge contributing to knowledge based society and we also say that we are not compromising with the quality so friends uh, this vision is seen after 34 years of the previous national policy we had a first national policy on education after independence it was 1968 yes. and the second education policy was in 1986 and in between we had a program of action 1992 but after 34 years we have come out with a perspective plan of taking this country towards quality for developing human resources which are essential for the progress and the prosperity of our country as well as uh, uh, the world order when you talk about the higher education there are several changes the policy recommended apart from the regular 10 plus 2 plus 3 system to 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 system and then curriculum changes the next assessment practices and the teacher professional standards many things are changed at the school level but today i would like to highlight something about the changes that we we will see in the near future in terms of higher education you know all higher education institutions to be consolidated into three type of institutions you know we know that we have a large number of institutions in this country which will uh, but discuss later we have about 945 higher education universities in this country we have about uh, uh, 45000 plus higher education colleges in this country and we have about uh, 26.3 percent of gross enrollment ratio in higher education so to improve the standards these three different universities probably in near future we will come to see the change that is happening in the university system the one set of universities research universities where equal focus on research and teaching will be given and the second set of universities are teaching universities where the primary focus on teaching with a significant focus on research as well you know it was uh, observed earlier that uh, not all universities can focus more on research because uh, the kind of facilities available in the university systems so friends uh, research universities give equal focus for research and teaching and the teaching universities primary focus on teaching 
but there is significant research at the university level as well and the third important thing is most of the colleges in this country are affiliated to different universities so the affiliation aspect of higher education is going to be demolished and the autonomous degree granting colleges are going to come so what i mean to say is uh, every institution in higher education will be having autonomy and with autonomy they also have the accountability so friends uh, the another significant aspect is to promote higher education we will be having multidisciplinary educational research universities like iits iims we will be having the interdisciplinary multidisciplinary research areas which is uh, the need of the hour somebody said if you want to address any social problem the problems cannot be addressed with a single disciplinary knowledge what is required is you need to have collaboration cooperation and the synthesis of the disciplinary knowledge of various uh, areas so disciplinary interdisciplinary perspectives are more promoted and the national research foundation as an apex body will be created and that will take care of a lot of research funding to the universities so all these kind of things are going to make uh, uh, the system more of liberal and with a lot of multidisciplinary perspectives in education where the individuals imaginative creative ideas will be integrated into the process of learning friends if you see the undergraduate programs they also talk about two years for those with three years undergraduate degree programs we will be having three years and four years undergraduates and those who have come out of four years undergraduate program they will have one year master degree and those who have come out with three years of master degree program bachelor degree program they will have two years of master degree programs and also five years integrated programs we will be having so what i mean to say is there lot of uh, access the scope flexibility freedom is given to the learner to choose what kind of subjects a person really interested and built up his expertise so that he will be able to contribute to society to great extent and coming to teacher education institutions gradually we will be having four year integrated teacher education programs and these models are already working in some of the uh, regional college of education done by ncrt and the existing two year program will continue for some time and in the coming years only four year integrated teacher education program students will be eligible to be teachers in our institutions so what i mean to say is there is a lot of political commitment to improve the quality and to make education facilities accessible to all kinds of learners in the country friends uh, there will be no separate demarcation with respect to public and private institutions and the standards norms regulations everything will be common to them and uh, there is a merging of institutions that taking place you know the ugc ncte aicte all these things will come together under higher education council of india and this higher education council of india will be having a uh, uh, four different independent agencies taking care of uh, 
uh, different dimensions of uh, higher education in the country. National Higher Education Regulatory Council for making regulations. General Education Council for standard setting. Higher Education Grants Council for funding. And the National Accreditation Council for accreditation. So what I'm going to see is a lot of changes are coming. Today we are talking about the new normal after pandemic situation, how the institutional setup is going to be changed. And as a new normal, how this national policy on education also make an impact in bringing quality in our education system. Friends, so, sir, there are two things that happened. One is this pandemic not only acted as an obstacle to stop the educational processes, but it also made a greater impact on four kinds of imperatives. You know, for the last uh, four or five months lockdown across the country, across the globe, resulted into four kinds of imperatives. One is uh, social imperatives, which talks about the, uh, uh, the, the social living of the people in a particular society, socially distancing, diversity, disparity, the social capital. And we have the economic disparities imperatives where workforce, employability in a country like America, the pandemic situation resulted in unemployability. And in Indian situation also, we know that many people have lost their jobs even if they are in jobs, their salary has been reduced or the working times have been reduced. So there is a greater economic imperative. The private institutions, especially the schools, when students are not coming to schools physically, they were not paying the fees when they are not paying the fees, though the schools are actually conducting digital classrooms and the problem of paying salaries to the teachers and uh, this has happened even to higher education system. Imperative on intellectual discourse, the kind of activities universities supposed to do in terms of teaching, research and extension they have, uh, to great extent, have been disturbed. And therefore, the intellectual capital where the universities are interested or engaged in creating the knowledge base has also been significantly affected. And the COVID-19 pandemic effect on emotional and well-being imperatives. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, how we need to handle our student support systems and thereby students will feel comfortable in carry forward their educational, you know, missions, educational aspirations further. Friends, one of the greatest imperatives of COVID-19 is the emotional and well-being imperatives. There is a, a great danger to the mental health of people across the globe. There is a fear, there is a frustration, there is a disappointment, there is a discontentment, there is a depression. All these things unconsciously entered into the minds 
of every individual across the globe so friends uh, we as educators at higher education system we have a role to play to handle such situations and make our learners strong with a lot of hope and the compassion to carry forward their educational mission further so today i would like to speak before you the covid 19 pandemic strategies for higher education there are two things which are important one is leading the higher education institution in the time of crisis is a very very important thing today therefore we need to understand what actually you mean by leading an educational system when you talk about leading in higher education there are two things one is leading people and the leading for learning you know leading people requires a collaborative empathetic with a lot of humility concern not with command with a lot of perseverance communication maintaining human relationships especially in the times of covid we need such kind of leadership now a leadership at higher education today where you call it as a, a autocratic leader a leader who demands a leader who instructs a leader who commands probably those kind of leadership styles are of no use in the kind of pandemic situation when everybody is looking for concern care love affection sharing caring empathetic so leadership for people requires the humility and the empathetic nature of the leader that you are talking about and the second kind of leadership which is important is leadership for learning friends in higher education or that way any kind of education that you are talking about the purpose of any education is to enhance learning create learning opportunities and create an institution which is which is a uh, very much possible to create the opportunities for the learners to progress in their life with the knowledge with the skills with the attitudes with the habits so friends uh, let us talk about the second thing leadership for learning and we have been discussing about this uh, learning has been disrupted over time <clears throat> and the learning has taken a different shape we are talking about digital learning we started educating people through virtual modes and the government of india has come out with multiple online platforms and they create a lot of uh, uh, what you call open educational resources so when we talk about leading for learning in the covid time requires understanding the psyche of learner what you call it as a student and the second important thing is providing support services for the students to continue their learning in a more effective way and the other significant area is 
continuously monitoring supporting the teachers community sustaining their motivation sustaining their spirit and then continue to contribute in the digital learning processes friends uh, these two are very very important in the times of covid now one is uh, how to make our learners comfortable in the learning process somebody said if you are comfortable with yourself first you can be comfortable with anybody in this world so if you want our learners to be comfortable with the digital learning processes which have become a new normal after covid we must make our learners comfortable to themselves we must make our teachers comfortable to themselves therefore teach a professional competency teachers continuous learning all these things matters to great extent so when we talk about uh, our student support and the progression in the covid times as i told you they are mentally disturbed socially distanced digital learnings are imposed and uncertainty unemployability and the future seems to be dark lot of disappointment discouragement so with all these things how you and me as the teachers of higher education system can really help them support them and lead them towards their academic progression so friends uh, if you see the nac uh, quality indicators framework and uh, i am very happy that uh, this particular webinar is being organized by internal quality assurance of the college i'm sure all of you know the seven the quality indicators of the national assessment and accreditation council and one of the very very important indicators is student support and progression friends uh, i have taken this point today to deliberate in detail and to understand what actually it is and how we as educators working in higher education can really work for it and make a mark and then contribute to the academic progress of our students you know the student support services that you are talking about they describe the different division of departments which provide uh, services and support to students therefore the students growth and development happens during the academic time okay so there is a beautiful saying you know it says the purpose of a business is to create a customer if there is no customer probably the business cannot take place similarly the purpose of any institution educational institution is to create the learner so we teachers working at higher education need to keep this important thing in mind that the how the zeal to learn how that the aspiration in our learners can be supported can be enlarged can be enhanced through our educational support services in the university in the covid times so friends uh, to do this 
we need to have two levels of management one is we talk about the macro level management where the the leadership at the uh, top level at the government level and the micro level is at your institutional level so both the leadership are very very vital to bring qualitative change and uh, provide quality student support services as a part of leading academics in the universities leading learning in the institutions you know the government of india has come out with the flagship programs and i'm sure those are in the higher education system i assume that you all know these uh, flagship programs you call it as a equip is education quality upgradation and inclusion program and the rise is a revitalizing infrastructure systems in education and the gyan is a global initiative for academic network and the locf is a learning outcome based curriculum framework and narf is national institutional ranking frameworks what i mean to say there are lot of national level initiatives flagship programs have been initiated by the government of india so this shows that there is a political commitment there is a strong vision and there is a strategy at the at the macro level at the policy level and if you see the national education policy 2020 it gives a very broad picture of a canvas of innovation creativity change that's going to happen in this country in the coming years to come friends uh, at the same time we must keep in mind that the policies alone cannot bring any change in any country policies will not make any change in this country so who makes it is the it is the practitioners it is the teachers it is the parents it is the community who can understand the essence of a policy and transform into an effective program friends here the commitment of micro level leadership the institution based leadership is very very important for student support services and quality education in the universities therefore you and me as educators in the higher education system we do have responsibility at the micro level at the institutional level to lead learning by providing adequate relevant and meaningful student support services thereby students feel comfortable and continue their learning process so as i told you it is a, it is a responsibility of every institution it's not a, your a, a, what you call a choice it is your responsibility it's not voluntary it is your responsibility what is the responsibility of your college your university is to see that those students who have enrolled into your institution to fulfill their educational aspirations need to get high quality education and they be provided adequate support and the welfare in the institutional setup friends therefore it is a, a part of our higher education responsibilities that student support services need to be handled and now during the time of covid when people are losing hope 
and getting affected both physically and mentally the student support services at the university systems need to be more vibrant more responsive you know the most of the questions that are coming now is whether we have a, a face to face teaching in the near future whether our examinations will be conducted or will be promoted what is the stance of the the university grants commission and thereby how universities really plan strategically to support students of future and thereby you are creating the credibility quality of our institution systems so student support areas include if i list it down there are 10 important things which every college every university need to focus on one is academic services academic services in terms of uh, curriculum in terms of resources learning resources in terms of uh, what you call uh, the guidance academic guidance in terms of uh, digital open learning resources this service is a very very important as a part of student support services the second important is admissions enrollment financial aid and orientation you know when everything is happening digitally there should be a proper window for students to get their questions answered amicably with a lot of patience so no student should be deprived of information so admission enrollment financial aid orientation everything need to be set up within the colleges and universities that's one of the very important uh, support system for the students and uh, once they join in the universities especially in the first year the students need a lot of guidance to understand the vision mission of the college and universities without understanding the vision and mission the code of conduct students basically feel sometimes isolated therefore in environment where students can socialize themselves getting introduced to other fellow students is a very very important thing that we need to focus on and another important thing is the alumni those who have passed out from the institutions how they can be connected to the institutions therefore collectively they come to the quality improvement of the institutions friends the fifth one which is the with that most importance is the campus <clears throat> we talk about sanitization safety student activities students unions so lot of efforts that the teachers in the colleges and universities the administration in the colleges and universities need to put in this aspect especially in the covid times how our campuses are our neat campuses our safe campuses for students to continue their learning which is a uh, very very challenging now and uh, what we need to do is we need to follow the uh, sop the protocol the standard operating protocols initiated by the ministry of health of government of india and the time to time the regulations issued by our ugc we need to exercise those at the campus levels what you call institutional levels friends the student counseling study career services are important therefore a continuous communication helplines need to be created at the institutional level therefore no important communication is uh, uh, is uh, lost into the process of social distancing 
and then the sports health recreation wellness then the diversity and uh, inclusion and the residential life of the students in the they are staying in the hostels so if you classify student support services at the institutional level these are the 10 important dimensions that we need to think of and how these things can be carried out in the institutions is a very very important things so friends uh, why such kind of student support services are very very important and vital in higher education there are uh, several research studies which basically talked about how the student support services can really contribute it has a lot of uh, uh, effect on students uh, academic success as i told you if students feel comfortable in your college in your university they will be comfortable in their academic process when they are academically pursuing their education they will be successful in their academic so student support services have direct uh, effect on students academic success some of you can take a uh, 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 research studies on this where the institutions which offered high quality of student support services have high quality of academic success of the students so friends please keep in mind that student support services is not uh, something apart from your academic orientations and tasks in the universities but they are the integral part because they actually contribute to each other and uh, there are research studies which have revealed that uh, the most important factors in education quality assurance one is uh, teaching learning process and uh, systems that support students welfare friends i'm sure we are all trying to get assessed by the nac so keep these three indicators these 10 different points which i mentioned to what extent our institutions are really responsive to or establishing those 10 different uh, uh, areas for student welfare activities in our institutions that will help the institutional ranking to great extent see another important uh, research finding i would like to share with you it says if a institution provides <clears throat> good quality of student support services they help in decrease the university dropout rate you know you also find lot of uh, our uh, students are dropping out from the higher education system because their queries were not addressed properly their needs were proper addressed properly their demands were not attended properly so friends the moment you set up a student support system that will automatically take care of the university students drop out rate in the university and another important thing is uh, student support services enhances the academic emotional and social connection not only within the students but they also share a greater bondage with the institution which is very very important now if you want your students to connect to your institution even after their course of study 
the student support services makes a very great impact friends these are actually i am sharing based on a significant research studies conducted across the world and therefore what law lot of organizations you talk about unesco they say that you know student support services need to be organized in a very very effective manner in the institutions and the moment you have more attractive student support services it will also result in the active leadership in the institution there won't be any conflicts there won't be any student unrest and rather students become the participants and they get engaged into the institutional development activities so friends uh, what i mean to say is uh, there are lot of uh, uh, researchers convey the outcomes of student support services and how the services can really influence uh, the uh, the development of the institution at large so i would like to share some of the prominent uh, recommendations that were made by the unesco as an international organization recommends a uh, uh, or uh, make recommendations to all educational institutions in the world you know it says if you want your students to have a relationship with your institution provide support and explain the values mission and policies of the institution is important participates in leadership and takes responsible decisions you are creating a collaborative leadership programs within the institutions and your institution evaluates the social experience of students in order to improve program efficiency you don't really organize the program you must really focus on how your program is making some social impact you know today we are we are actually talking about the impact analysis even when you do some kind of publications and therefore if you offer a program and if it is not making any social impact resulting into social development addressing the social the exigencies we need to really think about how the programs offered in the universities can really make a social impact and it supports the institutional values by developing and imposing student standards you know ultimately you are talking about uh, the standards of students when they come out of your institutions how they can really uh, 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 really fit into fit into a community and create a harmonious welfare society friends uh, it represents the institutional resource to work with students individually or in groups never consider students or a different group consider students are active partners in the academic leadership of our institutions which is a very very important thing and that has to be uh, uh, seen in our organizational practices and unless and until student feel that it is uh, my institution and that i can really do to the best of my institution things will never take place in this organization and when we talk about uh, student relationship with students which is a very very important now in the social distancing there is a fear composition that entered into the minds nobody is interested to talk to each other so the greatest challenge before you and me as educators in higher education system 
is to see how the transition takes place to university life when they are coming from schools or they are coming from the the uh, intermediate colleges the transition has to be smooth and they must experience the freedom of thought and expression not the suppression the higher education institutions need to provide the freedom the freedom of choice and the freedom of expression in the institutions so it is a responsibility of you and me to create that kind of an ambience that kind of uh, institutional you know or uh, behavior organizational behavior thereby each learner becomes more uh, uh, <clears throat> more vibrant responsive and comfortable to carry out their educational system and moreover the institution must create the opportunities which is a very very important thing they must create the opportunities see those who are studying in the institutions they always think about their employability so creating opportunities for them to face to the world of work and the show them the path towards how they can be employed if they are not employed how they can develop the entrepreneurship therefore they will be in a position to generate new employability for the people so friends uh, one of the very important student support services in institutions is to develop that leadership among the students create employability opportunities and uh, entrepreneurship so our universities and institutions are not mere academic institutions but they are preparing for life and living of the young minds that should be the concern of the university therefore uh, these three important things are important one is uh, employability and the second one is the entrepreneurship and the third one is innovativeness so these three things need hello sir hello hello that we are sorry due to network problem once again we will come back after few uh, minute
due to technical problem of speaker sir we are not able to audible and visible of speaker sir speech so that i request all of you wait for a few seconds Hello. 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 Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, I'm listening. Yeah, is it visible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, fine. There is some. There is some problem. Therefore, I yes. move towards uh, my mobile. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay, sir. There is some uh, crash happened, and uh, I'm I'm using through my mobile now. Okay, yeah. Is it is it clear now? Yes, yes, clear, sir. Yeah, fine. Yeah. So what I mean to say is, you know, if you want to make all these things into reality and make to happen in the higher education system, the leaders in higher education system. need to have six types of intelligences if you want to exercise leadership in higher education whether you talk about a a teacher leadership or as a principal of a college or as a convener of a particular program or the registrar of the university or the head or the dean of a faculty or the vice chancellor of a university so those who are actually having the leadership positions need to possess the six important intelligences and these internal intelligences will help them to make institutions more vibrant and more comfortable for the students to pursue their education please remember if there are no students in our institutions the institution cannot be called as an academic institution as i told you earlier the purpose of education institution is to create learner if there are no learners in the institution the institution cannot be called as an educational institution therefore to create such kind of educational institutions what is required is the six type of intelligences where every individual working at different levels in the university system need to exercise 
the first thing which we need to uh, think of is uh, uh, the contextual intelligence is important. The every educational leader need to have the contextual intelligence. What do you mean by contextual intelligence? It means they need to understand the context in which the institution is working. If you want to make something relevant, you must understand the, the contextual scenario of an institution. Where it is existing, what kind of uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, or the threats the institution is having. And if you understand these dynamics, then you are in a position to maximize the strengths within the institution. Therefore, the contextual intelligence is very, very important. You must know in detail about your institutional context, the context for which the institution is being served, and the context from where the student's population coming to an institution, and then how these two can be mapped within the institutional setup. This is a very, very important thing. So the first intelligence that every educational leader need to have is contextual intelligence. And the second one is the moral intelligence, moral intelligence, moral and ethical intelligence. Please remember that we are working in educational institutions. Whatever we do, we must do with a high degree of ethics and morals. If we don't practice what we preach, probably the same message will be communicating to our learners. And if these learners are not really implementing the moral and ethical values, then imagine what kind of society that we are going to create. So friends, uh, therefore, the second kind of uh, leadership, intelligence, that you and me have to exercise is the moral intelligence is important. And the third is social and emotional intelligence is also important especially in the times of COVID, we need to understand the social dynamics. We need to understand the uh, people in the situation. We need to be empathetic. And uh, we should not lose our emotion. We need to have the emotional balance to a great extent. Therefore, we will be in a position to understand the problems of the, the students group and we cannot uh, make it much wider and much bigger with a lot of intensity. And uh, the fourth uh, intelligence, which is important is the generative intelligence. Friends, uh, we are working in the higher education system is not only to give the information from one source to another source. We are not simply consumers of knowledge. The leadership, the teachers, the administrators at the university level need to have the generative intelligence which talks about we are not consumers, but we are creators of knowledge. We have the responsibility of knowledge generation, knowledge dissemination, and the knowledge uh, the uh, reach to knowledge utilization for the social impact. So, friends, uh, generative knowledge talks about your creative, innovative inputs, encouragement for people to think creatively, come out with uh, uh, a lot of uh, things that they can really do with their knowledge and skills. And the fifth one is the technological intelligence. Nowadays, we are uh, facing a lot of problems in terms of uh, uh, the technology, in terms of its connectiveness, 
in terms of the disruptiveness, you know, disruptive technologies, they keep on changing. Within last 10 years of time, we could see how the technological devices have been changed. Friends, uh, a leader also need to have the technological intelligence to understand how the technology is changing and how the technological potential can be tapped towards educational system and its progress and the quality improvement. Friends, uh, the sixth uh, intelligence, what I consider is a very, very important intelligence for every educational leader to leading learning in the COVID times is a transformative intelligence. Transformative intelligence talks about how the interaction that takes place within the institutions between the teacher and the learner, students, between the curriculum and the teacher and the student, between the administration, management, community, students, teachers. So how these interactions really help every individual within the organization to transform their life, their thinking, and their perspective towards human well-being. After all, uh, when we are working in educational institutions, our basic uh, purpose is to prepare human resources for the social progress. And here the social is not only local, but as the global. Friends, uh, every educational leader needs to be a transformational educational leader. Therefore, how to understand the issues, understand the challenges, understand the strengths of our institutional context and lead them towards progression. Taking your students into as active partners and leading them towards life, leading them towards learning and thereby they themselves will lead their own life. I think that is the essence of any educational system that you are talking about. And these things are very, very important to recall, especially during this time, because uh, everyone is uh, uh, disappointed. Therefore, uh, we must act as inspirers. We must act like uh, motivators. We must act like a ray of hope in their lives. And we must uh, lead the learning in our institutions. Thereby, students will be able to lead their life effectively, more meaningfully, and harmoniously. Friends, uh, this is what is needed and the need of the hour, need of the time. And uh, my purpose of talking all these things today in front of you is to remind our responsibility as a teachers in higher education system. With this, uh, I will stop my presentation. And I look forward for your questions. Thank you so much. And over to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you, Koronam Puspunadam, sir. So you have delivered a nice presentation on the policy, new exam policy 2020. So one question coming from Tulumani Sir, if everything is transformed to CVCS, what about the subject-based exam system, such as UPSC, CAT, CAT, NET, which demands single subject honors? Sir, are you audible to me? Yeah, can you repeat the question, please? Sir, if everything is transformed to CVCS, choice-based CAT system, what about the subject-based system, such as UPSC, CAT, GATE, NET, which demands single subject honors? Well, this question is coming from one of my participants. Uh, his name is Kulumani Pato. Okay, okay. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I think the only answer I should give you is uh, we must uh, wait and watch how this, the policy implementation takes place. It's a good question. You know, there is a national uh, assessment agency. And this agency will be conducting the national assessment testings. 
so multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary doesn't mean that the disciplines lose their disciplinary knowledge domain the disciplinary sanctity is not lost so to have a broader and a deeper understanding about discipline you take the help of the other disciplines so i don't think uh, it is uh, uh, practically it is impossible it can be very much possible and uh, there may be some kind of changes uh, we will be having uh, uh, probably in terms of uh, the the assessment practices that are going to come in the future we need to wait and watch thank you sir sir one question is uh, more many academicians criticize that this policy will make privatization of higher education in this regard sir what is your view point see that uh, privatization of higher education is a uh, is a strategy for example is a strategy in a sense you know that uh, the mission of the government is to make 50% of uh, gross enrollment ratio in higher education we have just uh, 26.3% of uh, gdp gross en enrollment ratio gr which means uh, in the coming years by 2030 35 we are aiming to make 50% gross enrollment ratio in higher education friends if this dream has to come true it's not overloading students in existing institutions you know the national uh, uh, knowledge commission recommended at least one university in each district in this country therefore it comes to something like 1500 2000 universities we supposed to have it so we have about uh, uh, 945 universities now and uh, uh, if you want to share the responsibility in terms of financial and also make your uh, society responsible to educational practices you need to welcome them to join in the educational mission so the private and uh, uh, the public cannot be seen in two different ways but they are the active participants in the society so friends uh, uh, public private partnership ppp model which our prime minister has been uh, supporting it it is a joint venture to restructure society and uh, there will be certain regulations you know the national education policy 2020 says the private institutions also come under a common regulatory practice of the government that means what happens there is a monitoring system so through this monitoring system the quality even the the expensiveness of the programs and everything can be uh, checked very effectively with the government i think uh, uh, privatization has to be seen in terms of making educational access to large number of people but privatization should not be seen from the perspective of uh, profit making and that aspect can be taken care of well with the government rules and regulations which the national policy clearly stated thank you thank you sir any other any other question please actually no question is coming from the other participants yeah okay okay thank you sangmai uh thank you very much sir for your informative and stimulating speech and you have mentioned so many aspect on new education policy which is going to be implemented in our country and uh, participant as well as with the people are uh, benefited 
with your uh, speech and uh, we are grateful for your patience and look out valuable time from your busy schedule thank you thank you very much sir thank, thank you. you very much thank you very much and uh, uh, the finally i would like to tell everyone take care of your good self and uh, be safe and healthy thank you so much okay uh, respected uh, participants now we are going to start our uh, second technical session in this session international speaker dr samud gupta bora samud gupta bora sir acu hello bora sir yep i can hear you yes 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 sir that uh, we are going to start our second technical session in this session international speaker dr samud gupta bora associate professor leading the developmental neuro developmental follow up and outcome at beta research faculty of the university of queensland south brisbane australia will deliver his speech before uh, going to start his speech i request dr momi datta coordinator iqc district girls college to give introduction of our international speaker sir so i hand over the uh, uh, to dr momi datta momi please thank you good afternoon everyone in this proud pleasure to introduce before you dr sobhanshu gupta bora Dr. Bora is an associate professor, principal research fellow, and a peer leader of neuro developmental follow up and outcomes at Meta Research Institute, the University of Queensland, South Brisbane, Australia. He was faculty at Harvard University, Harvard Summer School in 2018 at Harvard University USA, where he developed and taught a new specialized course in cell development. Dr. Bora received his doctoral degree from the University of Canterbury, New Zealand, and pursued postdoctoral training at the University of Canterbury, Washington University School of Medicine in Saint Louis and Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School, USA. He is the recipient of several competitive awards, including a New Zealand International Doctoral Research Scholarship in 2008. Outstanding fellowship at the University of Canterbury in 2016, and most recently, a major foundation research fellowship. His research focuses on a range of questions concerning high-risk infants, particularly those born prematurely, to improve the quality of life of children and their families. In addition to clinical research, he is committed to mentoring the next generation of scientists and children scientists in. The neonatal and developmental medicine. Today, Dr. Bora sir will deliver a speech on psychological PPE supporting mental well-being during COVID-19 crisis. Sir, we are eagerly waiting for your speech. Welcome, you sir. It's over to you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bora. Now I invite our speaker, sir, Dr. Sanjuta Bora, sir, to deliver his speech. You are welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, this invitation. It's a privilege and honor to be part of this fantastic forum, and it was great listening to this brilliant presentation by Professor uh, Pushpanadam. And um, thank you. And um, before I start, I must, uh, I'm just going to introduce myself again. Um, your colleague definitely gave me a very kind and generous introduction, but just as a bit of a context, I am here uh, in Australia now, but actually I'm originally from Jorhat. I was born and raised there, not too far from the city college. So, so I'm very much aware of the local context there. And uh, to a large extent, what I'm going to talk today will be uh, taking that context into account. So um, I am based here uh, in 
um, Australia, in the northeast part of Australia. And as you're aware, uh, we have also been impacted just like everywhere else in the world because of this pandemic. So I work in an academic medical center, which basically is a hospital attached to the medical school. And we are um, involved in teaching medical students, residents, as well as uh, doing research as Professor Pushpanathan highlighted about research universities. So we are a research university. So we do both teaching and research. Um, especially in relation to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, I am serving on the COVID-19 task force for Academic Pediatric Association. And that's uh, basically my professional organization. It's an international organization. And um, I'm involved uh, um, with the task force that has two main um, goals. And one is we are trying to identify COVID strat stressors and strategies to alleviate those stress stressors unique to our profession of pediatrics. Uh, we are also interested in supporting the well-being and resiliency of our professional members throughout the pandemic and the recovery period. So that's important to understand that the pandemic will be over at some point, but the impact will be long lasting. So it is very important to understand um, the role this pandemic will have on our life, and especially within the context of academic higher education. So as I mentioned, I work in an academic medical center, but the pandemic is very global. The pandemic, um, the global nature of the pandemic, I guess, makes my experience relevant for this forum as well. And I'm going to share some of the lessons that I have learned here being in the system in Australia, as well as my role in the COVID-19 task force in the US. And um, again, um, I'll be discussing it within the local context. So I don't have any slides to share. So pretty much I'll be talking throughout the whole presentation, but um, midway, I will share two resources uh, that will, I believe will be helpful for, for people to review. So over the next one hour or so, I'm going to focus on the impact of the pandemic, particularly on the psychological well-being, psychological well-being from an academic institutional perspective. So if you remember, we have discussed a lot about students, but an academic institution also engages teachers, administrative support staff, um, and um, there are other technical staff as well. So I think for the institution to be successful, we have to take everybody into account. And um, um, as um, from Dr. Kodoki introduced me, provided the topic of my presentation, I have, I'm calling it psychological PPE. So we all are familiar by now with PPE, that's personal protective equipment. That's what healthcare workers work or other COVID positive uh, cases work to, I guess, prevent the exposure of the virus or transmission of the virus to others. So that's, and that physical PPE is for the virus. Uh, but we also need psychological PPE. We need to look after our psychological well-being. And that's pretty much going to be the topic of my presentation, how to support the mental well-being during this COVID crisis. So before we get into this pandemic stuff, let's get the basics right. What is mental health? And um, it's an expression we use every day. So it's not surprising that it's often misunderstood. And in fact, whenever we talk about mental health, it's understood in the context of psychiatric or mental health conditions or mental health illness, such as depression, clinical anxiety, schizophrenia, and others. However, actually mental health is quite complex and it doesn't restrict itself to just the illness model. Um, in fact, according to the World Health Organization, mental health is a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential can cope with the normal stresses of life and can work productively and fruitfully. So 
so that they are able to make a valuable contribution to their community. So as clear from this definition, um, mental health is not just about illness, but it is actually about wellness. It sounds a bit confusing. To make things a bit clearer, imagine mental health as a continuum, as a, as a spectrum where one end of the spectrum where is represented by positive aspects of it, where we are feeling good, functioning well, and at the other end of the spectrum, it's represented by mental illness or psychiatric conditions where we, have, we experience different symptoms related to our thoughts, feelings, or behavior. So it's important to understand that mental health is a spectrum or a continuum. Mental health is very critical, especially within the academic context, as studies have shown it to be associated with increased learning, creativity, productivity, and positive social relationships. And outside of the academic context, it is associated with um, improved physical health, as well as increased life expectancy. In contrast, Mental health conditions, that's the other end of the spectrum. Mental health conditions can cause distress, can impact our relationships, and is associated with poor physical health and even premature death. But it's important to remember that mental health is complex. Just like teaching learning is a complex process, mental health is also pretty complex. Just because someone is not experiencing a mental health condition or is not diagnosed with a psych psychiatric condition, it doesn't mean that their mental health is flourishing. In other words, just uh, because there is no diagnosis, it doesn't mean that the person is performing at their fullest potential or is experiencing his or her, or her life to their, their fullest potential. At the same time, it is also possible to be diagnosed with a mental health condition, but still feel well in many aspects of life. So ultimately, mental health is about our cognitive, our emotional, our psychological, our social well-being, the way we think, feel, and develop our relationships, and not just merely the absence of a mental health condition. So I hope I have been able to make this distinction very clear. And I think it is critical to our understanding. So Winston Churchill once famously said, now is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. I'll just repeat, now is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. And I think it feels like just a right code for the state of the world today. The pandemic started. We are not sure when the pandemic is going to end. Um, it's you know not even the end of the pandemic, but I think we are kind of towards the end of the start of this pandemic. As you have been reading in the news or you have been hearing, I think our physicians are getting better at taking care of these people. We are getting more well-versed about this um, virus. We have more and more awareness about the risks of this virus. So I think we are getting to the end of the beginning of the pandemic and there's a long way to go. And um, it's going to be a long journey and a difficult one. And I think uh, it's important to understand that it is likely to have a significant impact on our mental health. So why the COVID-19 pandemic has become such a threat to our psychological well-being? Uh, before I jump into COVID-19 pandemic stuff, uh, let me clarify that it's what I'm going to talk today is not unique to this pandemic. In fact, there is a branch of medicine called disaster psychiatry, where feelings like what we are experiencing today, that has been experienced in other traumatic um, disasters as well. In Australia, we had bushfire. In US, we had 9-11. And um, so after those traumatic experiences, those disasters, um, uh, there has been plenty of evidence of poor psychological and well-being. 
And that is going to be very similar in this case as well. So why, why we are, why psychological well-being is, at, is threatened? As uh, in, we uh, heard in our previous presentation, uh, there is stress, there is fear, there is uncertainty. And of course, we are experiencing uh, social isolation. Within the context of our academic life or our daily life, there is a disruption to our routine. Our daily lives, our routines that has been completely disrupted. On top of that, everywhere in the world, we are experiencing loss of productivity, loss of unemployment, and loss of earning potential. And as we heard in the previous presentation, even if people are able to retain their jobs, the earning potential has gone down. Put that in the context of an undergrad or a postgraduate who is just looking uh, to finish their degrees. They're clearly uncertain where their future is heading to. They don't know if there will be employment opportunities suitable to their uh, training. And again, there is the stress of all this and this cumulative stress is going to impact our psychological uh, well-being. It's important to remember that everyone is impacted by this well-being. So everyone psychological well-being is at risk. It has to be acknowledged that our personal resources to provide psychological and emotional support to those who may need it is going to be significantly diminished. Uh, you have to imagine this as like, we all have a fixed resource or buffer to provide support to others. And if that buffer or if those resources are depleted because we have to take care of our own psychological well-being, and that is going to be challenging. So this very point highlights the need for self-care. And uh, it is very, very critical, especially in this pandemic, that we understand the value and relevance of self-care. If we don't take care of ourselves, or if we don't encourage others to do the same, uh, we will not be able to sustain our ability to care for those who are in need. So I want to make this point very clear. Self-care is very, very important. And that is going to help you in the long run to look after yourself. <clears throat> as we heard in the previous presentation as well, we are angry. We are sad, we are grieving, we are frustrated. Things are outside of our control. We have to adapt to a new system. And that is challenging. So today I'm not going to provide you any data uh, as by now you all are well-versed with the impact. You know exactly how many cases are there worldwide. You know the recovery rate, you know the death rate, you know how many cases of mental health uh, problems um, have been detected in your surroundings. So I'm not going to provide you any data today. Instead, what I'm going to do is, I am going to obviously uh, open this can of worms and try to understand how our mental health will be impacted or is likely to be impacted. And most importantly, I want you to provide you some strategies, some tips, on how to manage that. As I mentioned earlier, this pandemic has been spe uh, specifically challenging for academic institutions. And as uh, Principal Madam uh, mentioned in her introductory welcome speech, uh, obviously in a country like India, uh, we have some added challenges due to our limited infrastructure of digital health technology, knowledge, skills, and access. Even in high resource settings like Australia and in, uh, in US, we are, ex we are seeing uh, disparities in access to these digital technologies. So I want to make it very clear that some of the problems that you're experiencing, those are universal. Problems with internet speed, problems with internet access, that's everywhere. Even in places like Mass Massachusetts, Boston, um, where everything is, um, 
cutting edge or even in Silicon Valley, where the internet you would think uh, would be easily accessible at its fastest speed. Unfortunately, that's not the case. I regularly do video conference with um, people at Stanford, which is in the Silicon Valley area. And again, from time to time, we do experience disruptions. So yes, we have the added challenge because we are low um, in our ranking in terms of access and knowledge and skills. But again, uh, it is experienced by everyone. And um, another aspect, as I mentioned earlier, is that there is a lot of focus on our learners, uh, our students in academic institutions. But again, I will reiterate the point that we need to look after everyone. We need to be mindful that faculty, administrative staff, technical support staff, the board members, the leadership, everyone's psychological well being is at stake. So it's a good time to reflect why. So I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to talk about now, as from a very professional perspective, why um, those serving in the academic institutions or those learners in the academic institutions may experience, uh, uh, experience risk of um, psychological challenges. First is, let's uh, continue with the point of digital teaching. There has been a surge in demands for online digital teaching. We heard the numbers it's in billions, it's the size of the population of the in country India. So obviously there is a huge demand for online teaching. But on top of that demand, the supply is not great. There is a misbalance between demand and supply. When I say supply, supply in terms of access to digital technology resources. I'm not sure how many people in, in the country has got a personal laptop. If you don't have a laptop or a computer set up, uh, you know, or a smartphone, clearly there will be some challenges. Even if you own the technology or the resources, obviously the knowledge, the knowledge to use those technology or the skills to use those technology is limited. Since India has done fantastic over the uh, last decade in terms of our, our um, uh, uh, information technology, improving our information technology knowledge and skills. India is really a global leader in this field, but still, realistically speaking, uh, there is still a big gap. And if you take this surge in demand for online teaching and the mismatch with the supply, obviously it is going to create stress. It is going to create, um, mm, um, the psychological uh, challenges. And as I mentioned, even if you have access to the resources, our knowledge and skills to deliver um, lectures through the online mode or for the learners to, I guess, um, participate, uh, actively participate in those uh, online uh, modules, um, that could be challenging. There is a big fear of unknown and that sense of not knowing enough that creates anxiety. You know, we all are very competent people and all students, if they have, you know, they are also have their own competency. And this sense of not knowing enough creates anxiety about competency. To give you a very simple example, every time I have to give a talk and I log on to my computer, I have the sense of anxiety. What if I lose my internet connectivity? And that's an anxiety I'm facing. If I was giving this talk in person, clearly I would not have that anxiety. This anxiety is on top of the usual anxiety that goes on during a teaching learning process. So, so I think while this digital technology is great, it also is, um, bringing its own challenges and um, it is important to recognize that. Um, the next important uh, point that I would like to highlight is that in a country like India with lack of easily accessible mental health care, um, along with teaching and learning activities, all the faculty members have turned into 
of psychologists uh, themselves. They are trying their best to provide additional pastoral support. We heard from Professor um, Pushpanandan uh, around student support services. So just, you know, he provided us some beautiful strategies on what that student support service sh should include. And it was clear that we need to support our learners. And just imagine during a regular uh, academic cycle, we have so many uh, things that we need to deliver. On top of that, the need for additional pastoral support has just uh, um, increased drastically. Every faculty and student in some form or manner are equipping themselves to best support the psychological well-being of their peers, as well as for a professor, their students, and for students, their professors as well. We have to remember, it's a reciprocal relationship. You, uh, so everyone is trying their best um, to look after each other. And I think, again, in a country like India, where we do have limited access to mental health care, these ad hoc supports are becoming very, very, very critical. Next is around moral distress. So again, going on to this, uh, taking on the example of uh, digital teaching or online learning, I think all of us are experiencing moral distress. Um, there is a big divide everywhere in the world between haves and have nots. In, in the context of India, again, there is a big divide. And as faculty, we are concerned about how to minimize inequity. In a class of 30, how do we make sure that everybody has access to the same learning opportunities, regardless of their access to uh, internet or digital technology? Uh, to give a very simple example, a student may be accessing internet via phone. But I guess we have to consider, uh, do they even have the money for the top up? These digital uh, technology, they require a lot of data. And again, a lot of um, cell phone companies have been very generous in providing or relaxing those data usage costs. But still, there is a cost. And just a few minutes ago, I mentioned about loss of productivity, loss of income. So imagine the moral distress the learner, the student is going through, or the parents or the family is going through. They want to provide them everything, but do they have the resources? Similarly, from the prof professor's perspective, we all have a moral responsibility to make sure that these disparities are not amplified. So we want to make sure that everybody, regardless of their social or economic background have same opportunities for learning during this. But this moral distress is taxing. It does impact our psychological well-being. The next point that I want to re highlight is the feeling of guilt. Everyone is feeling that I'm not doing enough to support my profession. Uh, the rapid surge in webinars is a great example. We are, are you know, organizing a lot of informative sessions, a lot of webinars. And remember, that is adding to your traditional workload. We all are sitting here for the past hour or so listening to this fantastic forum that will help to, I guess, support our teaching and learning process. But this is this demand for our time, a competing demand, is on top of our traditional workload, which is already heavily burdened because of the changes. This is the same for the students as well. And I think there is a sense of not doing enough. So that, is, uh, that leads to the feeling of guilt, which leads to uh, subsequent psychological um, problems. So first I mentioned about, I guess, uh, challenges uh, in terms of infrastructure and not knowing enough. And now I'm saying sense of not doing enough. All human beings would love to support and deliver their best possible care, uh, deliver their best possible opportunities uh, for learning. And I think that sense of not doing enough leads to a lot of feeling of guilt. Um, as um, 
we all are aware, we all are working from home, we all are sitting in our living rooms, and it does problem bring its own challenges. And it is important to highlight that working from home has been more challenging for females and minority groups. And I think those vulnerable uh, population, there, is, there are a lot of studies coming out that female academics have been at a disadvantage at this, um, regardless of wherever in the world you are, they are at disadvantage. I know the data from US, I know the data from Australia, New Zealand, UK, the story is the same. Female academics, they are uh, heavily disadvantaged due to this working from home. Their productivity has gone down. And I think one very important point uh, underlying that, um, I guess, um, disparity is that there is a gender stereotyping. And if a female member of the family is there working from home, there is a traditional uh, expectation to support and help, the, help their child, their vulnerable population. So while I don't want to, I guess, diminish the role or the challenges that male academics are facing in, during this situation, I do want to acknowledge and uh, I guess, um, you know, commend the brilliant work that female academics are doing in terms of juggling their work as well as uh, family responsibilities. And it is very important. And uh, previously I mentioned the lack of control and autonomy. We don't know when the pandemic will end. We don't know um, uh, when we'll be back to in-person teaching. We don't know uh, if uh, we'll be doing this again next semester. So that lack of control and autonomy will lead to burnout. Burnout is inevitable we are going to feel emotionally exhausted uh, and our resources will get depleted. So I hope that I have been able to make the case that within our professional role as an academic, there are a lot of challenges that puts our own psychological well-being as well as the psychological well-being of our learners as well as support staff and everybody involved in the process is at stake. A related um, point that I like to, I guess, highlight here is, of course, uh, our personal um, challenges. Apart from our professional life, everyone is as facing this fear, this personal fear uh, of the risk of infection to themselves, to their family. So this fear of personal family health and safety obviously is um, is a key determinant of our mental health well-being. Um, in our previous presentation, we heard about the challenges of isolation and loneliness. We as humans live in a social world. Our social interactions, our intimate relationships, those are very special and those keeps us going. And this isolation to a large extent have made it difficult to experience those um, social interactions. A great example is, I think everywhere in the world, um, we take great pride um, and satisfaction in, ce in celebrating academic success. When we know um, somebody has done well, we like to celebrate, we go and visit them, we congratulate them, we send them cards, and there is a special meaning to that. I think it helps uh, to feel a sense of satisfaction, a sense of achievement. And I think that is fantastic. And that is just one of many examples uh, where our social uh, isolation is going to be problematic. A lot of our plans have been disrupted. Wedding plans have been disrupted. Um, similarly, funeral plans have been disrupted. All of those social activities have their own meaning. And I think the social isolation um, is going to be challenging. It has already proved to be challenging in a lot of contexts and it will, it will, it will continue to impact it. Uh, the next point that I would like to mention is around um, the personal challenge of uh, fear, grief, 
and exhaustion. And it is to a certain extent related to insomnia as well. Obviously, we have the fear of uncertainty, anxiety, loss of productivity, all those factors that is leading to loss of sleep, poor quality sleep, and that will lead to physical and mental exhaustion. So it's very important to remember that, that just like education is a complex process, psychological well-being is a very complex process. It is related to a lot of factors, including our physical health. And again, we are experiencing a high level of work-life conflict in our personal life as well. Our work life is disrupting uh, to our personal lives as well. Um, so for example, when we are working from home, a lot of us um, don't have enough space that every member of family can set up their own office. So we are encroaching on each other's uh, uh, private space. And that is going to create some challenges. Imagine your child or your uh, younger ones who is trying to study from home and do this um, homeschooling. At the same time, you're trying to attend the webinar. At the same time, your other family members is trying to do their own work. Uh, and you all are accessing the same internet, creating a lot of pressure. So obviously, along with the frustration of the internet speed, uh, you are encroaching on each other's private space. When we went to work during pre-COVID era, there was a distinction between our work life and family life. And I think that distinction really helped. And uh, this disruption to the barrier between our work and family life will take its toll and it is going to be challenging. So let's admit it, we are all tired. We are exhausted. And I guess the point here is how do we recognize that our psychological well being may not be at its optimal state? As I mentioned earlier, uh, just because a person doesn't have a psychiatric diagnosis, it doesn't mean that he or she, she is flourishing or the mental health is flourishing. That is not the case. So mm, it is important that, you know. Uh, we may be experiencing some subtle signs of psychological distress, and um, we should learn how to recognize those signs. And most important is how to manage those so that we don't end up from one end of the spectrum where we are doing well to the other end of the spectrum where we develop psychiatric conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder. So we should learn to recognize some common signs and symptoms, which includes feeling anxious, overwhelmed, confused, sad, bored. So when I think of these signs, I like to uh, think, put them in four different categories. One is cognitive, second is behavioral, third is emotional, and fourth is physical. And as I mentioned earlier, psychological well being is a complex process. So you may be experiencing uh, signs of distress in one domain and not necessarily in, across other domains. So it is very important to be familiar with some of the common signs. So when I say cognition or cognitive signs of distress, this could manifest as lowered concentration or poor concentration, poor concentration, uh, difficulty in thinking process or becoming very rigid in our thinking process, uh, this urge of perfectionism um, and our preoccupation with trauma. We are just waiting for the next, uh, um, I guess, pandemic. So those cognitive signs of hypervigilance may be uh, related to your underlying psychological distress. Um, there will be behavioral signs of distress, such as we may be withdraw showing withdrawal behavior, which means we are not participating in our social interactions or our day-to-day -day activities. We are having an avoidant behavior. Um, I mentioned about sleep disturbance. There could be changes in our appetite and uh, you know, we are becoming hypervigilant. So that's the behavioral aspect or some common signs of distress. 
emotionally, we may be exp uh, um, experiencing some signs as well. So if you're feeling guilt, I mentioned about moral distress, you know, that shows that you are experiencing some challenges. Anger, sadness, feeling helpless. You want to help your learners. You want to help your family. You want to help, but you are unable to do that within the current circumstances. And that is that emotional distress will be associated with poor mental health. And finally, there are physical signs of psychological distress, your increased heart rate, difficulty in breathing, muscle and joint pains, um, or increased severity of medical concerns. All of those are physical manifestations of psychological distress. So just to summarize, I guess, don't think psychological distress only in terms of emotional or behavioral symptoms. It is broad and it is a broad spectrum across cognition, behavior, emotion, and physical. And the examples I suggest that these are just a few, obviously this is not an exhaustive list, but it is important to learn to recognize those signs. Obviously, if we don't manage these um, uh, this signs of distress well, we are at the risk of developing psychiatric disorders. That's the other end of the spectrum, mental, illness that could lead to uh, depression or um, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. I'd like to, I guess, take a minute to um, elaborate on post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. The pandemic in itself is not going to lead us to post-traumatic stress disorders. But there could be some traumatic experience that we may have experienced or that we may experience that could lead to PTSD. So a lot of us, to give an example, a lot of our, I guess, uh, uh, armed forces that, um, that go for uh, protecting our borders and when they come back, they experience the signs of PTSD. So some aspect of this pandemic that is traumatic could lead to PTSD. And remember, not everyone ex experience of trauma is different. Just because I find something traumatic is not necessarily true for someone else as well. It is related to our own resilience, our own buffer of how we manage this with our own resources, our social support. There is also the risk that these um, uh, experiences of psychological distress may lead to some sort of risky health-related beha beha behaviors. Um, it could lead to um, you know, high intake of alcohol or tobacco or, and may even end up in alcoholism. Uh, there have been high incidents of family violence and interpersonal conflict, uh, domestic abuse. So these kind of adverse health behaviors are also uh, the consequences of the psychological distress that you and I may be experiencing during this pandemic. So I hope I have been able to, I guess, uh, so far explain the importance of psychological well-being give you some idea on how to recognize some of the classic signs and symptoms of stress and anxiety. And uh, here I'm now going to change gears and I'm going to give you some strategies. Think of it as a toolbox that you can access. Uh, I'm going to give you some um, tips and real life strategies um, that may help you to navigate this challenging crisis. Think of these strategies as your psychological PPE, your psychological personal protective equipment that is going to help you protect from these risks that's out there to our mental health during this unprecedented crisis. And um, a lot of these strategies that I'm going to share, they have already been widely publicized and you may already be familiar with a lot of them. So I do apologize for any redundancy. So as I uh, move on to highlighting the strategies or the, our psychological PPE in this case, please remind yourself all the time, as well as others around you, that the current crisis is temporary. 
we have seen the Spanish flu of 1918. We have seen a lot of other disasters. And we know that the COVID-19 pandemic is temporary as well. This crisis will probably change our lives forever, but the pandemic is going to be over. We don't know when, but it will be. Um, and another aspect um, that we need to, I guess, constantly remind ourselves is that everyone's readiness to absorb information or manage their psychological well-being is different. It is dependent on a lot of uh, aspects within themselves, as well as their biological underpinnings, such as genetic factors, their social environment, their financial situation, their economic well-being, their social support. So just remember that it is a complex phenomenon. It's not uh, easy, and everyone is experiencing this trauma, this crisis in a different way. So as I mentioned earlier, the most important mantra is the self-care. Um, when we get on the airplane, as part of the safety briefing, we always hear, secure your own oxygen mask before assisting others. That's exactly the case here. Secure your own psychological well-being before assisting others because if you are not feeling great, if your mental health is not at its best, it will be difficult to support others. And we don't want to get to that state. So what can we do to help ourselves and help those around us? What can we do as academics um, or other members of an academic community to help our learners who are looking uh, up to us to uh, I guess, find the best possible solution. How can we do that? So I'm going to give you 10 strategies that hopefully you can adapt to your situation and uh, you can, um, I guess, share amongst your colleagues, amongst peers and your learners. And these strategies are applicable everywhere. They are, they don't, um, you may have to adapt certain bits of it to the cultural and the local context, but in general, they're applicable everywhere. Um, so the so first important thing is we need a plan. Just like we heard in the previous presentation about National Education Policy 2020, that's a plan to move the country uh, to, uh, to improve our education delivery of our education in the country. So that's a plan we have put together. That's a plan that, have, that has been put together by experts to achieve the optimal plan. The same is true here. We need a plan. Remember, hope is not a plan. If you're hoping that everything will be fine, I'm sorry, that is not a plan. And you know, um, we need to work. We need to think on developing a plan, a self-care plan. So I'm going to share with you here a resource uh, that has been, that I have reviewed and I thought it is very, um, um, you know, um, applicable. And this will give you a good um, template to start with. This was developed by an institution here in Australia. And um, this just shows some examples of, uh, you know, um, how to come up with this plan. So I'm just going to also share my screen in this case and just give me a sec here, share screen. Just give me one sec, share screen. And you have this resources and this is a resource that's available uh, publicly. So it's easy to access. So how do we create your uh, self-care plan? Can everyone see my screen? Yes, sir. yes. Oh, that's great, yeah. Yes, so yes. as you see, you have this resource, but I'm just quickly uh, sharing this. So first, before you create uh, your plan, you have to know your coping skills. What strategies do you use when you are stressed? A lot of us will do some breathing exercise, we like to dance, we go for music, we read, everything is different for everyone. 
Of course, there are some negative strategies as well. Some people may yell, uh, yell at other people. Obviously, some people may just withdraw from friends and family. Some just avoid with social interaction. I mentioned about loss of appetite. So obviously, our coping skills could be positive as well as negative. So it's important to know what your coping skills look like. The next step is to know what is your need. What do you need to look at? You know, and self-care need when you look for when you're thinking it it has you have to consider your psychological well-being, emotional well-being, spiritual, social, financial. So what is unique to you, and where do you need a, a proper coping strategy? And next is reflect, think about it, examine, and adapt accordingly. We want to move from negative to our positive strategies, and eventually. First, we diminish our negative strategies of coping and eventually eliminate those. So, so this is an example here of your self-care plan, what it should look like. And I would encourage each and every one of you uh, to look at it and just you know, write down a piece of paper when you get a time over the coming weeks, come up with your care plan. Identify your areas of self-care your current practice and what you should do. So which means you should try some new coping skills. So here, for example, professional, you know, you are finding that um, you, are, you don't know how to put together a very good PowerPoint. Mm. Okay, you may have done, so, you may have had some strategies on improving your PowerPoint skill. You may try to revisit some alternate uh, skills. Should you uh, seek some um, um, seek the assistance of some experienced uh, PowerPoint presenter, or should you look at some YouTube videos, uh, or instead should you just try some alternate strategies? We don't have to teach using PowerPoint. Similarly, spiritual. If that works for you, you should you know think of how your spiritual beliefs your spiritual processes have been impacted during this COVID. And that may be related to your feelings of stress and anxiety. You're not able to go to temple, church, or whatever religion you follow. So what can you do to, I guess, alleviate your stress? So I'm not going to go through this list, but this is what you should be doing. Um, I think next one is to understand, have an emergency self-care plan. So when we're, we are in a crisis, when we are getting into the psychological uh, illness, the psychiatric condition, I think you won't have time to create a coping strategy. So I think it's important to understand how you are going to manage that situation, how you are, whom you are going to rely on, who are those family members, friends, or colleagues that you can share your thoughts and feelings. It's important to know that. And you also, it's important to understand what's unhelpful. Let's say you have a friend, very good friend, and you uh, call that person at the signs of distress. But you also know that that person by default, he or she, her person, uh, their personality is one of those of a very pessimistic view and which is not ideal at this point. They're always negative. So I think if you're in crisis, that person may not be the best social support. So you have to evaluate where you find comfort and where you find distress. Another thing that I would add here is the list of, um, I guess, your healthcare providers or list of your telehealth providers. And uh, um, in this case, we know that everywhere in the world, including India, we have moved uh, from regular uh, uh, medical visits to healthcare, but if we don't know how to access them, we're not going to be able to, uh, you know, use them when we need it. So I guess the question here is, you know, you should put together a plan and again, share. If you know that there is someone over there who provides telehealth service, telehealth psychological health, share that information with your peers, with your colleagues, with your students, so that they don't feel distressed if they're unable to find that information. Okay, so along with your self-care plan, 
I would also recommend developing a mental health check-in. And I'm again going to share the same resource that I had earlier um, from the same institute. It's the mental health plan. And again, I will share the screen here. So the mental health check-in plan. So let me share my screen in this case. Can you see my screen again? Yes. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Uh, so this mental health check-in plan, again, you have this. So obviously you develop your care plan, you know activities that help you reduce your anxiety and you get professional help when you need it. But this mental health check in template is great. I think it's fantastic. And you know, you this is, you know, just like when we, have a fever, we use the thermometer to take to get an idea of our temperature, how I guess high or low our fever is. This is just exactly the same. This could be the thermometer or your temperature checking apparatus for your psychological well-being. And I think it's important from time to time, you just make sure that you are feeling okay. As I mentioned earlier, it is, you know, signs of psychological distress are very wide ranging. It's not just emotional, but um, it expands into physical and other domains as well. So give yourself some time and use this information to see if you're feeling okay. If your body is giving you any signs of distress, are you sleeping okay? It's not just the quantity, but quality as well, your reactions and behavior. And I think that will give you a fairly good idea of how you are performing in terms of your psychological well-being. So, right. So we have our plan. We have our, I guess, um, uh, temperature checking in this case, our mental health checking plan. So we are set now. So what are the other strategies we can use? Uh, we heard in the previous presentation, as well as I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest stressor is our disruption to our normal routine. So create some sort of routine, even if you're working from home, create some sort of routine and create a distinction between work and life. And I think it's very, very important that this routine is specific to you. So I think you just uh, take your situation into consideration. Uh, to give an example, if five people are signed onto the internet at the same time or using the internet services. You know, see if that's really needed, if somehow you can reduce the pressure on the internet uh, capacity and you could actually alter your schedule. Develop new routines, but routine is very important. Also take breaks. You know, this is very tiring sitting in front of the computer screen, in front of the um, internet, in front of uh, using the internet or in using your telephone or smartphone, it is tiring. Our eyes get are strained. So make sure that you, know, you take adequate breaks. And uh, the third point is acknowledge your feelings. I mentioned, I gave you some tips on how to recognize, but also accept the fear, accept that it is an unknown territory, we don't know and seek support when needed. Seek social support, seek some sort of, you know, uh, if you're experiencing some milder form of distress, and if you feel that you are unable to manage it uh, within your own uh, resources, within your social support, within your, I guess, other supports available to you, seek professional support. Seek support of psychologists, academic counselors or counseling psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists, or your general practitioner, anyone who is, who is suitable to support you, seek that professional support. I would like to highlight that everywhere in the world, but primarily in uh, India, we still have a lot of prevailing stigma around mental illness. And there is this hesitancy to seek professional support. I would say break that barrier, and if you need any professional support, go and 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 uh, you know seek that. Just like when we are not well, we go to a physician and they give us some medication. Similarly, if we are depressed, uh, clinically depressed, or if you're clinically anxious, we should go and visit our professional um, um, uh, healthcare providers. 
The next important point is I mentioned the importance of our um, of social interactions and relationships. So remember, we are practicing physical distancing or spatial distancing of 1.5 meters. It's not social distancing. Stay connected, maintain physical distance, but stay connected. And there are lots of different ways of staying connected. It's obviously doing video chats, uh, webinars, all those are ways of, uh, of staying connected, but be creative. Sometimes just picking up the phone and calling someone um, and asking them how they're feeling without being judgmental can make huge difference. Um, and remember, it is a reciprocal relationship. You know, as academics, as faculty, you feel the need to check on uh, on your learners, your students, but. I would emphasize that even the learners, even students have a reciprocal role to make sure that their faculty members are doing well. At the same time, uh, uh, the teaching staff should be very much concerned how the academic or technical staff uh, uh, members are doing. As I said, it is a reciprocal relationship. We all have to, um, uh, I guess, um, look after each other and we are in this together. As I mentioned earlier, make sure that you titrate the information to people's readiness. Not everyone can handle the same amount of information. Apart from the traditional, I guess, virtual mode of staying connected, think of some creative ways. Um, for example, virtual book club is a very good way of staying connected. That will satisfy your intellectual curiosity. That will distract your mind from negatives and will give you some sense of accomplishment. We all can pick up a good book, 10 people can read it and we can discuss that. And you know, make it interactive so that it's not passive, but it's active so that everybody can contribute and they can stay connected. So remember, it's practicing spatial distancing, physical distancing, but we need to maintain our social relationships, stay connected. The fifth point I would like to meet, uh, make here is reach out to people, be proactive, we all are very altruistic people, but sometimes there is a bit of a hesitancy. Support others if you're available. Support in any form of manner you could. That will give you a sense of purpose. I mentioned earlier the sense of guilt, sense of not doing enough, how that's uh, related to our psychological problems. So helping others will give you a sense of purpose. And I think it is very, very important reach out to people. If you have not called someone for two weeks, pick up the call or send them a message. Don't underestimate the power of the social connectedness. The sixth point I would like to make here is keep yourself busy during social isolation. Learn a new skill. You know, uh, yeah, there are a lot, one of the positive aspects of uh, this pandemic is that our digital um, skills have just skyrocketed. Everyone around the globe uh, is in some form or manner uh, has come up with ways to access the internet. And that's great. So, you know, we won't be doing this webinar if we, uh, if we didn't have this opportunity. So try to make the most of it. Yeah, try to, I guess, um, learn some new skills, especially for students and other learners. Uh, of course, uh, learning is a lifelong process, but particularly for students in this case, where they are feeling uncertain about the career or the opportunities ahead, use this time uh, to learn some new skill that will give you an advantage. Or, you know, um, even if you're not learning a new skill, just engage in some sort of hobbies or something that will keep you engaged um, and be present. So for example, when we are in this webinar, try to engage with this webinar, assimilate the information. Don't just sign into a webinar and be passive there. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is you need to be more engaged and more involved. That's how you could reduce the negative impact of social isolation. The next point that is very, very important in this day and age is focus on facts and stay positive. Watch your media in intake. Remember, headlines are designed to report extremes. You know, 
we hear how many cases, how bad the country is doing, what's the death rate, but obviously uh, there is less emphasis on that how many people are recovering and that there are milder symptoms out there, how well we are doing in terms of supporting our learners, how well we are doing in doing these webinars. Try to focus on the positives and watch your intake. I'd also highlight that another uh, challenge in this day and age is that social media has made access to information very easy. At the same time, it has also made it very easy um, to, I guess, promote what we call fake news or irrelevant information. So it is important that you know how to, I guess, uh, you know, uh, know what is true, what is uh, based on true facts and what is just uh, fake news. The next aspect is look after your physical health. Physical health is intimately related with your mental health. Even if gyms are closed or you cannot go out for a morning walk or something, there's still many kind of exercise we can do at home. Do yoga, try meditation, try mindfulness. You know, it is very, very important. It doesn't matter what kind of exercise you do or for how long you do, or I guess, you know, the, the type of exercise, but doing some sort of uh, physical activity or engaging in some form of physical activity in a routine manner is very important. The next important point that is related to psychological well-being is sleep. And due to all the fear of uncertainty, fear of, I guess, um, this risk of transmission of virus, grief, everything else, uh, our changing workload models, our sleep has been impacted. Sleeping well. It's not just the quantity, but also the quality of the sleep. And I think uh, we should come up with strategies to improve the quality of our sleep. Uh, for example, we can engage in some sort of light reading before going to bed to distract our mind or avoid watching the news, uh, COVID related news or some sort of, I guess, uh, negative um, uh, news, which may impact or amplify our fear. So that's a strategy. Uh, watch your caffeine intake. You, you know, if you're not, a, if you have difficulty with sleeping, uh, you should uh, make sure that you don't drink, drink a lot of caffeine, tea or coffee before going to bed. That is going to disrupt your sleep cycle. And um, the final point that I want to highlight in terms of the strategies um, is, is the importance of religion and spirituality. If that's for you, if you believe in religion and spirituality, go for it. Religion and spirituality is a great power in healing. As I mentioned earlier, even while maintaining social dist uh, physical distancing, you could come up with ways to satisfy your spiritual need. Okay. So I hope, so far I have been able to provide you some practical tips and strategies on managing your uh, psychological well-being and optimizing your mental health during this unprecedented crisis. I hope we can come out of this on the other end with more compassion and empathy. Uh, I hope that this pandemic gives us the opportunity to improve the awareness of psychological and emotional health in general, as well as within the teaching learning process. We want to make sure that we take this opportunity to reduce the stigma and increase the appreciation for seeking professional mental health support when needed. I also mentioned earlier that uh, in a country like India, we don't have a strong infrastructure for mental health care. We should be able to advocate the need for strong uh, infrastructure and access for mental health care. Similarly, there has been a rapid growth in digital technology in general. And um, of course, the academic institutions, they have mastered the use of utilization of digital technology. I hope we continue to improve this great resource. And over time, this resource becomes more accessible and so that we can reduce the gap, the inequity. Uh, we also want to make sure that with this experience, with our reflections, with experiences, we are 
able to better recognize the value of self-care. We are not very good at looking after ourselves, but I think we hope that we take self-care as a priority in our daily routine. And most importantly, I hope when we get to the end of this pandemic, we land in a more equitable society. As Professor Puspanandam highlighted in the National Education Plan 2020, equitable is a very strong, um, I guess, principle that was clear in there. So we want to make sure that this pandemic lands up uh, in a very equitable society. It is a long journey. So I think and it, uh, we have to be mindful that we all aim for a more equitable society. So I'd like to finish by sharing a, a concept that was introduced by one of my professors at a Harvard Medical School, uh, Dr. Paul Farmer, who in my opinion, and as well as in the general academic community is recognized as one of the greatest names in the field of social medicine. And Professor Farmer introduced this concept of expert mercy. Expert mercy, uh, what it means is that, you know, mercy looks different in different situation. When you are, let's say, dehydrated or you have a fever, your expert mercy is the fluids, the IV fluids that we get. When we are quarantined with a mild case of COVID, this mercy can be dispensed at home. But when we are critically ill in the ICU, expert mercy may look like a mechanical ventilator or an oxygen mask. So what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, this is a reminder for all of us that everyone, regardless of wherever we are, we have a role to play uh, in combating this pandemic. I hope this presentation has provided you your own personal protective equipment, your own psychological PPE to support your personal mental well-being as well as those around you during this COVID-19 crisis. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your time and consideration. And I will be happy to answer any questions. I can already see that there has been a few questions popping up uh, in the chat window. Um, I think uh, I'm happy to directly take it from the chat window, but if I miss something, I'm hoping, uh, I guess the moderators could help me. Um, so first question is, so first question I will just, uh, is from uh, uh, Professor Joges Chiang Mai. And the question is, what kind of strategies can be adopted for promotion of mental health of college students? It's exactly the same as what I suggested in uh, today's presentation. So first is they need to have a self-care plan, like I suggest, uh, like the plan I template I shared. So they shouldn't be able to know their own coping skills and what are positive and negative coping skills. And so they shouldn't develop their own plan. Second is from time to time, they should check on themselves if they could recognize their signs of distress. And you asked specifically about promotion and how we can promote uh, strategies. I would say widely share uh, this information. Webinars like this are very helpful to um, increase the awareness about mental health needs. Another aspect as I mentioned around, I guess the, we discussed uh, the underlying factors for psychological, for experiencing psychological distress. So we have to think of how we can, as an academic community, address that. So one example is I mentioned around, I guess, uh, um, making use of this time to develop some additional skills. So I think that could be something we could do. It's not directly related to mental health strategies, but obviously it will help them uh, to achieve their sense of uh, achievement and that will uh, support uh, their psychological well-being. So pretty much all the um, strategies that I have mentioned today, they are very much applicable to college students as well. Uh, the second question here I have is, how can we solve or minimize the feeling of guilt of female academics? That's a fantastic question. And I highlighted the point of uh, challenges experienced by female academics. I think first is, um, you know, 
feeling of guilt is is normal and as i said you know um it is um it is something that's there uh, so first is recognizing that they are experiencing uh, added challenges that's a great start um we need to create awareness amongst our family members, amongst our society, amongst our community, amongst our leaders, um, uh, our, our academic institution board members. Everybody needs to recognize this fact that they are in a disadvantaged position. So mm, while mm, enhancing equity is not something we can achieve overnight, if we promote, if we recognize that they are experiencing some challenges, that's a good start. We need to think of coming up with some creative strategies. So for example, let's say um, instead of delivering a lecture at 10 a.m. or let's say at uh, you know 11 a.m. while a female for, because of her typical, I guess our gender roles, may be busy in the kitchen preparing lunch, Perhaps we should not schedule anything. Let's say our staff meetings, our faculty meetings, you know, we should be mindful that we should be and be organizing that at a time that is convenient for everyone. So we have to, so that's another strategy. We need to do that. It's also important to, I think we have a role for our male academics to support our female academics. I guess, is there any opportunity for co-teaching or is there something within the workload model that I could help with? You know, um, that is something we need to ensure that. It's very important, you know, we want to make sure that we don't, while trying to help them, we don't reduce the opportunities for growth and recognition for female academics. There is a very subtle difference here, you know, while we are trying to help them, we should not um, create more challenges or more disadvantages for the career advancement. So it's, um, you know, it's a fine balance that we need to maintain because that will worsen the situation. So um, I think we, I'm not sure if we could solve the feeling of guilt, but we can certainly minimize the feeling of guilt and it will be collective effort. So our policies and guidelines need to be framed in a way that are family friendly that are female friendly or fe friendly for every uh, gender. You know, um, again, I will emphasize that while I'm highlighting mm, the disadvantages experienced by females, of course, there will be some males who are also experiencing similar challenges. And I think the point here is this uh, adaptation of policies or rules or guidelines or our commitments need to be family friendly. So that's, I think, the most important point. Uh, I, uh, the next question is by, from Tirani Kanta Biswas. And the question here is, we the college teachers of Assam are doing very less for our students during pandemic situation and feeling guilt. How can it be reduced? Again, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, the sense of not doing enough is um, is leading to our feeling of guilt. But think, are you are you really not doing enough? Means you know you are uh, you are providing. You had to readjust your teaching through uh, using digital uh, uh, methods. You had to readjust your lecture. You're juggling work and life. So we have to be a bit realistic here. Means you know who sets the bar? Who tells us what is enough? You know, I think uh, we have to reduce our expectation. This is also related to the previous point around female academics. We have to be realistic. This is an unprecedented crisis. We have never seen or experienced like this anything um, in the recent, uh, you know, uh, decades. So we have to readjust our expectation. As I mentioned, we are providing, you know, we have done some others, um, I guess, we are creating additional opportunities. There's, a, there's just 24 hours in a day. So we have to be realistic. Guilt is, uh, you know, normal, but we have to be mindful that we 
uh, you know, we assess that in terms of how realistic or unrealistic it is. As I said, um, we also have to be to make sure that we look after each other, but we are also less critical, less judgmental. We don't know other situation. I don't know what's what's going on in your families. I'm giving you all the strategies, and you may have some challenging situation which may not be relevant. So I think be realistic of what we can or what we cannot do and have a conversation at, with your administration, with the leadership, with the authorities, what is the most important thing that's needed? Prioritize, come up with a plan, just like your psychological well-being plan, come up with a plan for your, you know, how to help your students. If there are 10 things, what are the what is the most important thing in the list that we think we need the most? Identify the three strat three aspects that's most important. You can also do divide and conquer. Let's say you can come up with small committees uh, where let's say I will look after the delivery of teaching learning. I'll make sure that everybody is well equipped, no one is left behind. Another another committee can look after the psychological well-being. They can help to promote strategies, share resources. And the third committee can look after, you know, um, I guess, dissemination of scholarly knowledge. Um, I'll give you an example from my own profession. I mentioned I am in the Academic Pediatric Association COVID-19 well-being task, COVID-19 task force. We have divided ourselves into three committee. Create curate and advocate. So in create, we are identifying the stressors. We are kind of, you know, uh, recognizing the challenges. The curate one, we are trying to come up with some solutions. We are not designing solutions. We are trying to see what's out there and put it together and make it accessible. And the third uh, subgroup advocates, like advocating that, you know, we need to have family friendly policies. So that's what, so I think, we cannot um, address each and every problem, be realistic, prioritize, and come up with a group solution. Uh, the next question is, um, uh, the name of the uh, attendee is not uh, provided. The question is, how to deal with the mental health of students having not access to online learning facilities like smartphone, computer to data to operate them? I think that's a fantastic point question. And you know, uh, um, it is um, these social disparities or economic disparities will have uh, impact um, on their, of course, learning. In, and that will also have impact on their social connectedness and all the things that I mentioned. Well, the few things we could do, uh, we could be creative here. Uh, you know, do you really need smartphone to teach? Uh, can you do something else? Uh, can you, for example, I know in Rwanda, a lot of lectures are delivered through the radios and things like that. So that's available to everyone. That's a creative way. Um, another way of doing it is you may be able to, you know, think around, um, let's say, how to adapt your teaching materials so that it could be delivered in a, um, that doesn't necessitate the use of a smartphone. You should be very careful while we are preparing presentations, not to overload it with images and videos and all that thing. And since the pandemic, I have been very careful of not using PowerPoint slides because it, there is a huge uh, demand on data usage. And I don't want to make, you know, end up everyone's um, data uh, capacity. Similarly, uh, let's say when we are having a webinar, do you need the video? That's the, that's the thing, you know? So we should, we should come up with a list of things that are essential for the activity, in, in this case, teaching learning, what is the basic minimum we need to keep it all going? And what is kind of, let's say, luxury? Um, also, as I said, there's a big social responsibility on our part too. If you can help, help others, you know? If you have an extra smartphone at your home or anyone you know, uh, you can um, donate it. You can create a central pool within your institution where anyone that um, you know can take a smartphone on loan so that they can return it 
uh, once their need um, is uh, resolved. Similarly, uh, you could, so one example I'll give here is before the pandemic, a lot of, I guess, our colleagues over in our institution, they donated cell phones uh, that was taken to India as part of a um, project um, for, uh, for a detection of cerebral palsy. And uh, so you can do very similar things here, pool resources. If you have extra of anything, give it to them. You can probably liaise with the cell phone providers that people have access to capacity you may be able to support your students by recharging, uh, recharging, you know, providing them data plans or internet plans. Here I will make another, I think, as I say, it's a social responsibility and it's a reciprocal relationship. You can provide everything to your students to support them, their online teaching, but they also have to be respectful of what you have provided. They should not be misusing resources that have been provided for the purpose of learning. So, identify the needs and identify the resources you have at your disposal and, and you, you, you can be able to support um, them in some form or manner. It may not be the best way, and, but it is, you know, there is something we could uh, do. And don't be afraid of asking, ask, ask cell phone providers. They have a social responsibility. Ask your government, ask your local government if they can do something as well. Uh, so I think in the interest of time, I'll keep moving. Uh, next question is around mental health of the people is badly affected in this pandemic period. Yeah, I agree with that. Everyone is experiencing some form of psychological distress. Um, so how can we manage it for the people, including our children? And as I said, in the, my presentation, I gave you some strategies and all of those strategies will be uh, helpful for you, obviously. Um, some of that um, for younger children, some of those may not be relevant and you have to titrate the information. You know, they, to a certain extent, their psychological well-being is related to your own well-being or adults' well-being. If parents are stressed, their, their little ones are more likely to be stressed. So make sure that you, know, you understand this transmission, familial transmission of psychological challenges. In terms of children, again, you know, keep them socially connected. You can have play dates uh, via Zoom or you know, all sorts of video conference mode or WhatsApp, keep them connected. You can celebrate, you know, events like their school graduation, birthday. As I mentioned earlier, it's physical distancing. It's not social distancing. So everything that I said in my presentation will be applicable to children. You just have to titrate it. And uh, then there is a question from Minulo Tanewar, how to minimize feelings of depression and how to help people suffering from bipolar disorder. Okay, so depression and bipolar disorder, uh, these are clinical conditions which needs, uh, with, which, uh, you know, um, uh, we need to manage uh, that um, in accordance uh, in a, with uh, the psychiatric principle. It says, so this is a mental health condition, mental health illness. So that is the, different from, um, uh, experiencing uh, some sort of psychological distress. As I mentioned, it's a spectrum. So what you're saying is when you, when somebody is experiencing psychiatric conditions, psychiatric illness like bipolar disorder, how we support them? So the most important thing is be in contact with your psychiatrist or psychologist or your medical provider or your mental health provider. It, it requires professional support. You can provide the social support that comes along with um, the, the expert professional support, but we need to ensure that they're getting the right medications. If they are on medications, if they're experiencing uh, some sort of uh, you know distress, be mindful that you know because of their psychiatric illness, they may be experiencing it differently. And um, my best advice, my is to engage uh, with your mental health provider in a very timely manner. Don't delay um, you know, because uh, you, may th you may not have ready access to your mental health provider, but please remember that a lot of 
facility, a lot of, I guess, health services across the country um, are providing telehealth services. So yes, if you're experiencing psychiatric illness, psychiatric uh, conditions, please, please seek, um, uh, please consult your professional mental health provider. And other signs of psychological distress or milder forms of distress or emotional um, challenges, you can manage um, uh, with the tips I have provided. Uh, I think I think the last question here uh, I have is how to protect children from mobile phone mania, which badly affecting on their mental health. And this is a question from Anwar Hussain. And I guess, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure what you mean by mania here. Is it that they are um, engaged on, they're spending too much time on their cell phone? Or do you think they're, um, you know, I think uh, they're experienced, they have some sort of, I guess, uh, distress or they experience some sort of, I guess, aversion towards cell phone. I think it's the first one, I because that's a worldwide problem, screen time, and it's not just cell phone, it's television as well. You know, uh, there are uh, some strategies. Um, uh, I think um, clearly uh, at this time, we really need this uh, digital technology uh, or access to digital technology, but you can set, set rules and boundaries. You can, you know, uh, you can make sure that uh, they, they know that they have access to the cell phone only when they need it. You should know their purpose and you know they do it, and and the purposes, you know, they could be di um, different. You know, they may need it for their uh, online learning and teaching. They may need it for connecting with their friends and family. They may need it to relax by playing some games. So obviously, there's, there's a diverse range. But again, come up with a plan, a routine. Make sure that just like when they go to school, they have a routine, they have a timetable. Put them on a routine. Also use reinforcement based um, strategies. So for example, you know, if they do what they're supposed to do, if they're doing all their chores, if they're, you know, behaving well, okay, you can use uh, your screen time, your phone for 30 minutes. Regulate the usage. That is very, very important. Regulate the uh, usage of screen time and make sure that, you know, um, um, they have good role models. Uh, it's uh, children look up to their adults. The children look up to what's going around in their society, in their community. If everyone else in the family is just sitting on their cell phone, playing games or chatting or doing something else, or, you know, uh, I think uh, we are not sending out a very good message. So that is something we have to be good role models for children, come up with a routine or plan, and limit their screen time usage. And um, I think with that, I hope I have answered all the questions. If I have missed anything, please feel free to, um, you know, let me know and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I don't know if we're running out of time, so I'll leave it up to the moderators um, um, to proceed from here. And once again, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic session. I appreciate your listening and all the questions, very thoughtful questions and very relevant questions. That is great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mumi, moderator of uh, this session. Thank you, Samadhi Gupta Bora, sir, for uh, your informative and resourceful speech. Thank you very much. And you have mentioned <clears throat> so many uh, mental health problems and you have shared uh, so many examples, experiences related to mental health. And uh, you have mentioned so many ways how do we can uh, solve the adjustment problems of students in different situations, uh, as well as uh, we are highly benefited with your speech. So thank you very much. Thank you participants for uh, today's uh, technical session too. And uh, thus here we concluded our second technical session here. Thank you. Thank you very much.